All right, Ramit Sethi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, so man, I've been like we were, we were talking about this the other day. I've been following you and your site. I will teach you to be rich. When you first started back in like 2006 or seven, and this is when I had a personal finance blog. People don't know that about me. I, I my first blog was called the Frugal Law Student. So I read your stuff because I was in that that sphere. But what's interesting is to see how your business or the content you put out there on I Will Teach You To Be Rich has evolved. So it started off primarily a personal finance blog, uh, but now it's something different. It's more all-encompassing about living a good life where you talk about entrepreneurship, social skills, fitness, psychology, productivity, et cetera, and they all seem connected. I'm curious, what would you say would is the underlying philosophy or objective of I will teach you to be rich right now. For me, it's about showing people how to lead a rich life. And I like that word because rich can be different things to different people. And I'll give you an example. When I started off in personal finance, the predominant worldview was that you shouldn't do anything with your money. Cut back on lattes, cut back on everything. And I just didn't believe in that. I mean, I took a look around at my friends and my friends wanted to go out. They wanted to buy a round of drinks for their friends. You know, we just want to have a good time. And so I started to develop this philosophy. And it started with money, although I think money is really just a small part of living a rich life. I think if you ask people, even the people who are listening right now, what does a rich life mean to you? The things they're going to tell you are not going to involve like stacks of cash. They're going to say, you know, I want to be able to take a trip in the middle of the week. Um, I want to be able to, um, you know, get a really nice jacket and not worry about it. For me, the rich life when I started off was simple. It was like, I want to be able to buy appetizers at a restaurant (laughs) because my family, we have a pretty big family. We didn't have a lot of money. We never ordered, we didn't even eat out. And when we did, we would never even think of ordering appetizers. So I think that a rich life evolves over time, but it also is unapologetic. If You want to buy a $2,000 coat? Awesome. Let me show you how to do it. I'll show you how to negotiate your salary and get a $25,000 raise. If you want to fly your parents out for their 40th anniversary and surprise them, this is something I just got back from a few days ago, and you want to put them up in a nice house with a chef and all that stuff, do it. Let me show you how to start a side business, and you can earn that. So for me, a rich life is unapologetic. It's different for everyone. It can be about giving back to charity. It could be about just getting a nice pair of shoes. It could be about getting fit and changing your mind. And so that's the kind of general philosophy that goes through everything we do. Right. Or it could be like, I just talked to a guy the other day. He lives on a homestead in Vermont in a house he built. Perfect example. Perfect example. Because that is really off the beaten path. And you wouldn't think money directly ties in with that. But for him, that's a rich life. That's why I say money is a, an important part, but it's a small part of a rich life. Right. And so it seems like what you're doing with I Will Teach You To Be Rich is you're, you're, you're disrupting thinking patterns that people have about what is and what is not possible. Because I think a lot of people are, they have this idea, okay, if I want to have a good life, I have to go to college. I have to get this certain kind of job. I have to live in the suburbs. I have to do this, et cetera. But you're saying, no, not necessarily. You, and you challenge those assumptions that people have. C- completely true. If I had followed my typical default life path, I would be, I'm about 5'11", 5'11 and a half. Uh, I would be 127 pounds. I'd be working at Cisco as a network engineer. I'd have an oversized white polo shirt that I wear with khakis. And that would be it. That's my default life path. And when I took a look, I just said, that's not where I want to be. And so that means everything from um, stepping outside the typical job situation, turning down a job offer at Google, starting my own company. Uh, It means stepping outside of the typical entrepreneur mindset, especially online entrepreneurs who say, I don't want to have a team because that's a lot of responsibility. Well, guess what? I want to have an impact. And so if that means I have to have a team, then I'm going to learn how to have an amazing team. And then it also means learning how to get fit and change the way I look and dress. And I think that's important too. So the world wants you to be vanilla. It wants you to follow these typical paths because it's comfortable and the entire world is built around that. When you try to step outside of that, you get people who will give you varying degrees of pushback. That's always going to happen. In fact, the more and more 
you do it, the more and more you're going to get. But that doesn't mean you should stop. Gotcha. Well, you're talking about, you know, getting fit, right? Like, I think this is a really, it's been fun to watch your transformation. Because um, I remember, like, you know, way back when you were, like, you were doing, like, little classes at Stanford about personal finance. <laughs> yeah, and it was I, so cool. Yeah, awesome. you know, you, <laughs> you had the big polo shirt. You had that rocking, <laughs> I believe. Um, and you were skinny. And, like, you decide, I mean, what made you decide, I need to get bigger and stronger? I mean, that's something we've talked, you know, we have a lot of guys on the podcast. I'm about to talk to a power lifter who can deadlift, you know, 800 pounds. Oh, my God. Um what like what made you decide like that's an important part of my life that I need to focus on that? You know, there's there's two parts, uh, and both of them are not what you'd think. It, it's not that I sat down one day and I examined the health benefits of muscle gain. No, I sat down one day with a girl that I was dating, and she's a really sweet girl. Uh, and one day she made an offhand comment about how. She, she was basically, she said, I want you to gain more weight. And I'm like, this is really weird for this girl to say this because she never had a mean thing to say about anybody. And she said, I want you to gain more weight because it, it will make me feel like more of a girl. I thought, wow, that is the kind of comment you never hear. That's like a life changer, game changer. And the next day I went to work and there was a guy used to work with Brian and I asked him, you know, can you help me? learn how to work out. And I was 127 pounds at the time. I had the body of a supermodel, a female supermodel. And I asked Brian, like, hey, can you show me how to work out? So he takes me to the gym, starts, you know, showing me some machines and stuff. And he goes, all right, you want to gain weight? Uh, Do you like Thai food? Okay. Do you like milk? Do you like this? Do you like that? I'm like, yes, no, yes, no. He goes, he thinks about it for a second. He goes, all right, you need to eat all those things. <laughs> so that was one. And then the second thing was when I moved to New York, I took a look around me and it was very obvious that people in New York look great. They look great. They have great fashion. Just everybody's playing at another level. And I was like, this is a great opportunity to step my game up. But I have to tell you that I was pretty nervous. Um, I wanted to get a personal trainer. I could afford a personal trainer it still took me four months to get the courage to walk across the street and go get a personal trainer. And when I did it, I basically put myself in his hands and I said, I'll do whatever it takes. And he said, all right, we're going to start. And I just, I happened to walk in and luckily find an amazing trainer who I've worked with for years now. But you'll notice that none of these things, it wasn't like I was debating the difference between a three-day or a four-day split with your chest or powerlifting versus Olympic. None of that. It was all emotional and psychological. And that's something that I think a lot of people uh, overlook. They'll spend years and years looking at different splits and different workouts, but not realize most of it is psychological. And once you master that, then the actual workout you do is pretty straightforward. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things we can unpack right there. So one thing I noticed about uh, I Will Teach You To Be Rich and the content you've been putting out in recent years is a lot about behavioral psychology uh-huh. and, and, and tapping into that in order to motivate uh, yourself to improve your, yourself or in, motivate customers or motivate employees. Um, and I think that you just mentioned there's a lot of, like a lot of people when they approach fitness, they, they get very analytical about it. And then they think that's the answer, right? I got to be very rational and reasonable about this. But you're saying that, no, that's not really the best way to approach it. You need to approach your person, whether it's personal fitness or your finances, thinking about emotions first, because that seems to be the big driver. Because what got you going wasn't like, you know, like you said, it's not about, oh, this will help me be stronger and this will extend my life. It was like a girl told you, like, you make me not feel like a girl. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I'm so glad to be talking about this here because I think for men in particular, not only are we hyper rational or we, we believe that that's the way to be successful, but we actually shit on emotions. And I actually am guilty of this as well. If you go back and listen to my early videos, I joke about being an emotional robot, ha ha ha. And, you know, growing up as an Indian guy, you're not really taught about the emotional side. It's like a very stoic kind of way to grow up. And in a way that taught me a lot of stuff. Like I rarely get bothered by little day-to-day things, et cetera. I'm pretty steady. But when you approach the world with logic only as your foundation, 
then you start to, it's, it's a real problem because you're approaching the world as a robotic automaton. And then the world does not work that way. And I'll just give you a perfect example. There, I walk outside uh, a few blocks away. There's a hospital. There's always a bunch of nurses and doctors huddling outside smoking. Now, how does the robotic person rationalize that? These nurses and doctors know every single fact there is to know about how bad smoking is for them, and yet they still do it. So if your worldview is only operating rationally only, then it makes no sense. What you're missing is the psychological, the emotional, in this case, the biological dependence. Same thing for working out. Do you think overweight people don't know they're overweight? They fucking know. Do you think they don't know it's bad? They know. Do you think people who don't have enough money like they haven't ever seen a compound interest chart. They've seen it a million times. And it gets me angry because in the personal finance world where I started off, like 99% of the experts there, they go under this worldview that let's just educate these people. Let's teach them how important it is to invest at age 25 and that'll get them. You know what normal people are thinking? Like, I don't even know how much I spent last week. Can I afford to buy this drink for my friend or am I going to look cheap and try to slink out the back? And so once I understood this and I learned this at Stanford, I learned this in an applied way with my readers, then it started to really connect. So the big thing I would just say is it's not – you don't need more facts. The facts are out there. You can get them with one Google search. If you wanted to lose 30 pounds and you were a robotic automaton, you could do it. And yet you have it. So what is it? Is it that you don't have the right facts? No. There's something else going on. And that's really the crux. The difference between what we say is important and what we actually do. That's really the crux of what I Will Teach You To Be Rich is about. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's interesting. Like They've done research where they say that we make decisions first on an emotional level. And then we come up with the reason, right? Like why yes. we did this. And like, I think men are really guilty. Like they think they're like, I'm making a logical decision here. It's like, no, actually you are coming up with a ex post facto reason <laughs> why your gut said you need to go with this thing. And they'll yes. talk about like, oh, I'm, I'm buying this car because it has these features. It's fuel efficient. Yeah, no, no, you thought it was a cool car. Exactly. And you know what? The, the, my favorite studies in psychology are the ones where the experimenters vary just one variable and they can experimentally show that it's because of this one factor. It's not logic, it's not the facts, it's because they changed the color of the car. And that's what got 27% of people to buy it more. And they go and they actually tell the subjects, hey, this is why you bought the car. And they, the people will be like, no way, that's impossible, you don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, no, we have the data, this is experimentally shown. Nope, that's not why, I chose it because it has a four wheel drive, okay. And the, one of the greatest books on this, by the way, is a book called Mindless Eating. It's by a Cornell professor of food psychology. And he basically shows how we think we're super rational and logical when it comes to eating. Actually, we're anything but. We eat not just because we're hungry. We eat because the colors are brighter, because the plate is bigger, or even because the bowl is closer to us. If you move the bowl like two feet away, our consumption will go down like over 10%. So it's a great reminder that we are not robotic. We're not rational. We're emotional and psychological creatures. The minute you can get that is the minute you don't look down on emotion and psychology, but you actually start trying to understand this entire invisible world that exists around us. So okay, let's take let's figure out so that we, we understand this. So how can an individual you know, they understand, okay, I'm I'm an emotional being. I'm making decisions based on emotion. I'm motivated based on emotions. How do you harness that? So basically, basically what we're trying to do, I guess, I guess a lot, there's that uh, analogy that uh, we're, we're, there's like, we're an elephant and an elephant rider. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. So the elephant is our emotions and, and the rider is the, 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 the rational part. So how do we get our rational part to direct our emotions so we can leverage that to improve our life? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So let's, let's get into the specifics because one of the things as you start to get into this theoretical world, it gets really up in the clouds. So we can talk about how it applies to finding a dream job, how it applies to starting a business or getting fit, whatever you want to talk about. You tell me, but let's get down to sort of the street level. Let's talk about getting like, your dream job. Perfect. All right. So just think about all the invisible scripts. This is a phrase, invisible scripts, which are beliefs that are so deeply held to us 
that they are invisible. And these invisible scripts guide our lives. One invisible script you probably have is education is great. More education is better. That's an invisible script for basically every Indian person. I actually think it's a pretty good <laughs> invisible script, but it's an invisible script. My invisible script when I was in college is I'm a 127 pound Indian guy. I'm just a skinny Indian guy. I can't get as big as those white guys. Okay. That was an invisible script for me. Do you have an invisible script in your own life that you can share? Man, I'm trying to think of one. Um, You're like, invisible, so it's right. kind of hard to think about. It's kind of hard to think <laughs> about. Like, I have a hard time like asking for things. Perfect. Right? Perfect I'm not example. the kind of person who asks for things. Right. And if you dig deeper, you might even find out that um, you don't believe that you should get help based on someone else. You should do it yourself. Right. Very self reliant. Self reliance. Yeah. Right. Pull yourself America. over your bootstraps. Right. Exactly. Okay. So it really goes deep, right? And it's so deep that it's manifested in these really weird ways. Like you might have someone who you meet at a cocktail party and they're like, Hey Brett, like, I really want to like hook you up with this job or this opportunity. And you, you're like, Oh, okay. And then you just don't follow up. And later someone's like, Hey, this guy wanted to put you on the today show. Why didn't you follow up? And you're like, Oh, and it goes down into that invisible script. So let's apply that to jobs. There are these invisible scripts floating around us that are so pervasive, you almost can't escape them. So this mindset is, uh, the economy is bad. I should just be lucky to have a job. And if I get an interview, I'm going to go in there and try to impress them. And hopefully I'll get the job. Okay. All that sounds reasonable, but if you take that approach, you are doomed because you are now doing what every single other person does. And that is adopting the frame that the economy is bad. Who says the economy is bad? For top performers, the economy has never been better. I'm recruiting over 10 people right now. I cannot find them for the life of me. And I will also tell you that top performers are routinely getting $20,000, $25,000 jobs. So that's balloon puncture number one. Number two, I should just be lucky to have a job. Well, is that true? If top performers can leave their job on Friday and have a new job offer by Monday, maybe you actually have a lot of leverage. And then three, if you walk into an interview and you hope to impress them, it's kind of like going on a date. You know, yeah, of course you want to impress them, but you also want to be seeing if they impress you. In other words, you're the prize. Not to be arrogant, you actually have to be good at what you do or you have to be attractive and engaging. But if you walk in from a position of subservience, you already lost. So that's, that's a total different view of finding a job, okay? I can go into specifics about how to do it and how to stand out. Most people take the completely wrong approach. They just submit their uh, resume online and wait. <laughs> the problem is like 10 million other people do that too. But I'll just say that you have to change the mindset and study what top performers are doing. Top performers know that companies are desperate to find great talent. They're desperate to find people who come in with ideas and actually execute them. And if they do that, they will pay. And they will pay like a huge amount. So this is the difference between what most people do and how to take behavioral psychology and change the way what you do. Gotcha. Well, I mean, here's, here's something. We don't have to get the specifics of the job. So maybe you already have a job and you like your job. Um, you've written a lot about this, um, like asking for a raise. Yeah. Right. That is like one of the, I think one of the, I think it frightens a lot of people because I think there's that <laughs> invisible script that like, I, I, I shouldn't ask for this. I should be just lucky that I have a job. So how can we use behavioral psychology, understanding this whole, you know, we're emotionally driven. P other people are also emotionally driven. How can we use that to overcome that fear and, and ask for a raise? Okay. So the invisible script here is great because in our culture, especially in America, um, n not only do you not negotiate, it's actually looked down upon. And if you think about the examples from popular culture, who do we have? We have used car salesmen. And if you think about a used car salesman, it's like you crinkle your nose. You're like, ah, that's so disgusting. Well, I actually think that negotiating can be really good, but it's a different approach. Um, you don't walk in there and bang the table. The way that you can negotiate a salary increase, it, it's, it's different. So I'll give you a couple of examples. And there's a bunch of free stuff I'm going to point you to. One, you have to first know what it takes to be a top performer at your job. So this is how you do it. It's not a one-day process. You don't walk into your boss's office and say, give me $10,000. He's going to tell you to get the fuck out of here. 
You say, you walk in, you say, you know what? Uh, let's say your boss's name is John. John, um, I'd love to set up a meeting with you to discuss what would it take to become a real top performer here? I'd like to outperform what I did last year, and I'd love your help in coming up with a few KPIs, key performance indicators. Every boss is like salivating over getting that email. So John's like, come in tomorrow, let's talk. So you walk in and you're prepared. You do something, you walk in and you say, you know, based on what I've seen here, this is what I'm seeing are the key priorities of the business. Here's what I'm working on. And if it were up to me, these are my three KPIs. Improve sales 13%, improve retention 10%, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Are these the right goals for me to be working on? So then you guys have a nice discussion. Maybe you come back in a couple days with some more data. And you say, okay, John, I, I get these three numbers. I just, I'm going to work on these, and I'm going to update you every two weeks. And now, assuming that I hit these goals, I'd love to discuss a compensation adjustment. But we can discuss that a few months from now. But do we both agree that these are the numbers that I should be pursuing? Yes. Okay, so now you've sent an email record. You've got it all written down. Do you see that we haven't even talked about money, really? Right. This is completely different than what people think about a negotiation. So now you go back, and you have to actually do the fucking work. And I say that because so many people think, oh, there's some magical phrase that's just going to get you $10,000. No, you need to actually do the work. So you do the work. The key here is you update them every two weeks. Hi, John, just want to let you know we improved the optimization process. We're on our track, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so by the time it comes time for your compensation discussion, not only have you exceeded your goals, okay, but you've let him know the entire way. So there are no surprises. So now when you walk in the room, you are armed to the teeth, and it's a friendly discussion. One, you already have the numbers. You've crushed your goals. Number two, you've looked at the comps around you. And three, you have the right words on how to discuss this. I'll just tell you <clears throat> one more little secret that a lot of people don't know, and then I'm going to tell you where you can find all this stuff for free. So the secret is bosses get basically a certain amount of money to distribute to their team. Let's just pretend for easy math that it's $100. So, you know, uh, Joe over there is not really good at his job, so we're going to give him cost of living increase, 3%. Um, the other guy, uh, wh whatever his name is, Mike, he's pretty good. We're going to give him, you know, 10 bucks, 10%. But there's this one person who's absolutely amazing, and I'm going to save all my chips, all my money, and give it to him because I want him here, and I want to promote him. Your boss will tell you, sorry, can't do it. This is the economy. It's Times are tough, blah, blah, blah. It's BS. If you are a top performer, you will get the lion's share, or you can leave and get it from another company. But you have to approach it in the right way. So if you guys want to find out how to do this, the words and all that stuff, I put up a bunch of free videos. You can just Google Ramit ultimate guide to getting a raise. I mean, most people can use that stuff and get a five to $10,000 raise right off the bat and it's free. So check it out. I think it will be helpful. Right. And that, there's two things there we can unpack. So that's a big win. Like that's a big, ma that's a mantra that you have on. I will like go for big wins. Yeah. Right? You, Easy. You want to talk wins. about that? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Right. Cause like, what's the, cause this is like another invisible script. I think people have is like, you know, we're going to go for just small incremental, which is fine. Right, I'm a big believer in improving one percent, but there's there's always opportunities to make big changes, right, and big improvements. Yes, big wins. So, okay, there's a thing in psychology called the principle of being a cognitive miser, and a cognitive miser means we have limited cognition and limited willpower. It's like you can't walk around all day making a ton of decisions. It's like lifting, you know, doing a bicep curl with a 45. You're just going to get tired after a while. And so it's ironic that we spend our valuable cognition, willpower, and attention on decisions like, should I buy this $3 latte? Who gives a shit? $3 doesn't add up to anything in the grand scheme. I'd rather negotiate my salary, get a ten dollars to $20,000 raise, and lock that in for years to come. So the I Will Teach principle of big wins says, get the five or ten big wins in your life right, and you never have to worry about the rest of this questions. For example, here are some potential big wins. Get it, getting a dream job, automating your finances, getting fit, having great relationships. You know, maybe some people want to put food up to having great food. Okay, fine. It's up to you. It's your big wins. But there are some classic big wins that most people cluster around. If you do that, you never have to worry about 
you know, can I afford to take this taxi instead of the subway? Or, oh, can I order this dessert? I don't know. Like those questions are irrelevant. Once you have a great job, maybe you started a side business, your money's automated. And to me, that's much more relieving. Like I actually love going outside and not having to look at the price tag when I'm at the grocery store. It's cognitive relief for me. To me, that's freedom and that's a rich life. Right. And I guess another big one you talk about is like, you know, negotiating your rent down. Is yeah. Another one, right? Because that, that frees up so much more money where you don't have to be a cognitive miser about your resources. Totally. So th- there's this concept we have called the tripod of stability. As you can tell, I love names. <laughs> I love it. No, it's great. It makes, it makes it easy to remember. Yeah. So the tripod of stability says, get these three critical things right in life. And most of the rest of it, y- you can afford to be more risky. So let me give you an example. I'm conservative on where I live, which means I pick a great place and I stay there for a long time. When I used to have a car, I picked a good car and I kept that car for a long time. A few things, right? Relationships, etc. If you are conservative in those areas and you pick, you make a great choice and you stick with it, then you can afford to be really aggressive and risk seeking in others like my business. Like we can afford to try these crazy experiments in our business. And you know, I know that I have this tripod of stability that I can lean back on. So absolutely that's true for your job, for negotiating your salary and for many other things in your life. This sounds very much like, uh, Talib, Nassim Talib's like barbell strategy, right? Where yes, you, you get like have like you have a lot of conservative, you know, money, so you can take more risk in other speculative areas. Exactly, right. All right. So the other thing I, th- it was, I thought was interesting in your um, negotiating example is that it's it seemed like the the employee has to become an entrepreneur. Like it sounded like the employee was treating his boss like a client. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what I mean. Like, you were like a freelancer giving a pitch to the client. And I think a lot of people have this mentality that, well, I'm an employee. I just, just tell me what to do and I will do it. But it seems like in order to get a raise, you have to be a little more of a self starter, more of an entrepreneur, even in a nine to five job. Well, that's one of the deepest invisible scripts there is. And that is that mommy and daddy should tell me what to do and I'll be a good boy or girl and do what they say. And that script plays out almost every day of our lives. In fact, if you're listening to this, I will challenge you right now to think of an example where that mommy, daddy, invisible script played out. Was it at your job where you waited for your boss to tell you what to do? Was it in your personal relationship where your partner told you what to do and you actually felt good when they did it? Now, I'm actually not saying there's anything bad about that, okay? Those can be great invisible scripts. But when it comes to a job, if you want the extraordinary results, then you have to do something different than what most people are doing. And the frank truth is most people are going in, they're doing what they're told, and they get a nice cost of living increase, 3%. That's the way the world works. If you're comfortable with that, awesome. Maybe for a lot of people, they just want to end at 5 p.m. and they want to go do their own thing, awesome. But if you want that $25,000 raise, you know, I just posted on Instagram yesterday. This guy used four of my courses. He, it, he paid about 4,000 bucks over two or three years. He made $72,000. Okay. That guy's atypical. He's awesome. If you want results like that, you don't just go to work and do what the boss tells you. You have to actually, exactly as you said, treat them like your client, be proactive, understand the business and make some pitches. So you pitch them, you make the business case, and suddenly your boss, every time you walk in, they're like, ah, Mike is here to tell me what he's going to help me with. Instead of Mike is a burden that I have to feed and you know tell what to do. You become not a liability, but you become an asset. And I mean, I think that's, a, that's hard to do because I think, yeah, that invisible script of just waiting for people to tell you what to do and not being a self-starter that's hard to overcome. Yeah. So, I mean, is there anything we from behavioral psychology or any like just quick, I don't know, nothing, I hate like quick life hacks or whatever, but like, I mean, <laughs> is, is there something you can, that sort of a philosophy you can do to help you jumpstart your self-starting mentality? Yeah. Okay, so first is to know that when you, when you start trying to become a self-starter at work, it's gonna be hard and you're gonna make mistakes. That's really important. You're not gonna be perfect at this. For example, you might pitch these ideas to your boss, which gets shut down because they're crazy and you don't understand the pitch you're making. 
That's going to happen. Expect it, acknowledge it, plan for it. We call it failure expectation. When I was applying for uh, colleges, I already planned on not getting in and I had my backup. I was going to write them an essay, send them my new clippings because I already expected to fail. You should do the same thing. So don't try to be a perfectionist. Your first few times of trying to be a self-starter are going to suck. That's okay. The second thing is to study what other people are doing. There are a lot of self-starters at your company. Go find the person. And by the way, it could be outside of your company. Go talk to the people who have sailed past everyone else. You know, they became a VP in like three years. How did they do it? And sit down with them and say, look, I, I really admire what you do. I'd love to take you out to coffee. Could you share? You seem to have you know, sailed past everyone else. You have an intuition. You have a knack for knowing what needs to get done. How do you think about this? And then they're going to give you these vague platitudes and you bring it down to earth. You say, okay, here's where I am at my job. I go in. I do these Excel reports. It's fine. I get a 3% cost of living. I want to get promoted. I want people to listen to me in the room and on and on and on. What would you do if you were in my seat? Okay, that's number two. So you're asking other top performers how they do it. And trust me, there's a lot to learn. Those top performers have been top performers since they were six years old. So you're building a whole new muscle you've never used. The third thing is talk to your boss. Exactly what I said earlier about going in and asking your boss what it takes. Do you know how many people on my team, they will come and be proactive, but they're kind of proactive about the wrong thing. And then they go and talk to their manager or they talk to me and they say, what would it take to be a top performer? And the manager knows, I need you to hit these numbers. And if you hit those numbers, you become a top performer. So don't just try random things. Get help from other top performers and from your boss. That's awesome. Well, here's another big picture approach that I think applies to a lot of domains, not just uh, your job, not just uh, money, not just personal uh, fitness. But, you know, I get a lot of letters. I just got a letter from a guy yesterday saying that, you know, he'll get really motivated. You know, he's, those emotions are working in him. He's like, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to, you know, go in and ask for that raise. And they start taking action. And then it just sort of just putters out. Like the emotions go, they're, they're gone, mm-hmm. right? Emotions are fleeting. Um, and they just, they, they're stuck back where they start and they get really despondent. So it seems like there's something from what we've ta- been talking about right now is that we have to, there's something in behavioral psychology that we can leverage to help, I don't know, offload some of the, I think it's, I think it's going on. There's like, there's an overload of cognition going on. You're trying to yeah. do a whole bunch of things and uh, you have to, I guess, have a system in place. So when that emotion, that motivation is gone, that you have something carrying you forward with your goal. Yeah. Well, let, I'm curious from your perspective. I mean, you've been at this a long time. It would have been easy to get bored or lazy or not be motivated one day. So what what has pushed you through, especially in the unmotivated times? I mean, I just, I like, this kind of sounds kind of dumb, but I treat it like a job, right? It's like if I had a job at a nine to five, like I would still have to do it, right? I mean, right. I, so I, I have like a system, like, okay, from this time to this time, this is what I do. Even if I don't feel like it, I got to do it. And then what's, what's, here's the interesting thing is like, once I start doing it, I actually kind of get into it, right? Mm-hmm. Once I start doing it. Love it. I'm so glad you said that. By the way, for everyone listening, notice that the question of motivation, if you talk to people who are really good at what they do, they're not talking about motivation. They're, they're not. If you talk to people who are really fit and you're like, oh, bro, how do you get motivated to go to the, they look at you like you're fucking crazy. What do you mean motivated? That has nothing to do with it. It's, they completely sidestep that. And it's about discipline and it's about systems. So I'm going to give you a couple examples from my own life. Um, I love that you said you treat it like a job. I also love that you said once you get good, then you get motivated. Um, There's a great book by a friend of mine, Cal Newport. Um, It's called Getting So Good They Can't Ignore You or Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. And he and I both agree. A lot of people think, let me, let me, what am I passionate about? And then I'm going to go get good at it. And we believe get good at it and then you become passionate. So get good at it. What does that mean? Start by crawling, then walking, then running. You can also use, I mean, Brett, like you, I hate life hacks, sort of like very reductionist, but I used to try to get motivated to go to the gym. And what I did was instead of feeling guilty and judging myself, I started to try to look at my own behavior with the mind of an experimenter. 
very non-judgmental, but just saying what's working and what's not. That's hard because you look at yourself and you're like, oh my God, I've been talking about starting a business for five years. I don't do it. I suck. I'm worthless. You, you got to put those aside. So I created like a basic Excel sheet and I was like, I'm going to test a few things. And I tested like writing it down. I tested listening to cool music, all this <laughs> stupid stuff. And then the thing that actually worked for me was putting my gym clothes next to my bed, like folded and ready to go. And I would roll out of bed and put them on and get up and go. And you know what's crazy? When I actually figured it out, I realized why I hadn't been going. And this is the, this is the craziest part of all. My closet at the time was in a different room. I'd wake up in the morning, it was freezing cold. And I didn't want to have to go just in my boxers to the other room, shivering to put on my clothes. It was that simple. And you would think, oh, like that's so easy. Don't be stupid. Don't be lazy. But again, if you're not adopting that robotic mindset, if you realize that we are emotional creatures, you realize that sometimes even the most minor of barriers can stop us. And so just basically don't be so hard on yourself, but take an experimenter's view and test different approaches to see what works. Gotcha. So, I mean, but I guess you do have to have, I mean, I think a lot of guys have this idea of the kind of the man they want to be, right? Yeah. They want to be confident. They want to be able to provide for their family. They want to be, you know, all those things that we kind of think of like the ideal man. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you have to, I, I guess, do you have that picture in your mind the entire time and then you just get to work? Or is it, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, like, how do you take, go from big picture to little picture? Like, should you have a big picture goal? You're like an ideal you're shooting for? Or should you just kind of stick to like the minutia and just focus on the process? I don't know. I mean, I think this is different. I'll tell you my f perspective. Honestly, I didn't start my business out um, with this grand vision in mind. That's I didn't, just not I didn't I either. Think. Yeah, I didn't either. Right. And I, I just find the more and more people I talk to, especially once you have a couple drinks and you know, you get to know somebody, look, they're all like, I had no fucking clue this thing was going to work. I just started it out because I felt like I had something to say. And over time, you know, I learned how to be more strategic and think about vision and all this stuff. But like, honestly, I started my blog in 2004. I was a college kid. I was cocky. And I was like, these people need to hear what I have to say. And it was as simple as that. And the only difference is that I stuck with it um, for years. And each time I tried to improve, I knew my stuff was all right, but it could be better. And I think a lot of it is just longevity. If you stay and you keep working at something, you're going to get good at it if you are studying the best. But to your question about like a, an ideal man, I think that's so interesting. Um, because there's you know, a lot of emotion in there. A, there's a lot of emotion involved in that. A lot. And we take our cues from the media too. So if you look at what is your ideal man, you know, is it uh, a guy who, you know, has a ton of women? Is it a guy who has a ton of money? Is it a guy who has a ton of style? What is it? Um, I think that we are more influenced by the people around us than we would let on. And I also think you can tell a lot about someone by their heroes. So I'll give you an example. If you think about Silicon Valley, one of the biggest heroes there is Mark Zuckerberg. He started a startup from nothing. He maintained control as he raised tens of millions of dollars in venture capital. He wears a hoodie and he built a product without much marketing. It was viral. So those four components are really critical because Silicon Valley lionizes those things. This is why you see a bunch of young tech entrepreneurs who think marketing is stupid, fashion is stupid. And I should build a product that's viral and I'm going to maintain control at all costs. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the hero archetype in Silicon Valley for a lot of young entrepreneurs. Move over to New York and take a look at the Goldman Sachs CEO who has this massive empire, maintains a fleet of black cars and has ultimate control, et cetera, et cetera. That has produced an entirely different type of hero and a different type of follower. So just think to yourself, who are your heroes and what does that say about you? In the internet marketing space, which I want to take a huge shit on because people, <laughs> I mean, give me a break. All they want to do is make a million dollars. They don't want to put the work in. Not do anything. They want to live, you know, go to a beach, right? Oh my God. Okay. I'm so glad you said that. I went to this conference, which I should not have gone to. And I brought one of my staff members with me and we all went around the table introducing ourselves. And I told him, I said, listen, watch when everybody introduces themselves because they're going to say two things. They're going to say how much money they make 
and how little they work. And he's like, no fucking way. I was like, watch. So lo and behold, like 20 seconds later, the first guy goes, he goes, my name is Blah. I make um, like $20,000 a week and I work three days a week. It's a good life on the beach. And I just look at my friend and he looks at me and I'm like, told you. So I hate that. If that is your hero, then all you're going to care about is how much money you make and how little you work. And that's going to influence everything you do. Um, so just be very mindful of the heroes you have. And you may realize that the people you were, you know, that you were admiring, you may want to think a little bit bigger. That's something that has been critical to me as our business has grown. Right, right. Well, I mean, let's talk about starting a business. I think that's a dream of a lot of guys. The whole idea of being self-reliant, yeah, owning a company, you know, it's the American dream. I know it's not for everyone. Like, I mean, I think it's complete. Like one of the things I hate about the internet business world is like, they put out like, this is the only way to live a good life, right? <laughs> if you don't start a business, you're a failure. Yeah. Everyone and it, should. And if, if you live in the suburbs in middle America, then like you yeah. suck. And it's like, I man, like I, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the suburbs. And like, I kind of, I, I like my life a lot. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what is the thing? I, mean, I think a lot of guys, they want to start a business and like online is where you have to do, even if you have a, a brick and mortar business or you have a service you provide, you have to be online, um, you know, marketing yourself. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make when trying to start a business? Cause I, I have my, I've, I've, I have my things that I've seen when people start a business, but I'm curious what you, what you've I saw. I can't wait to hear yours too. Um, okay. My, the things I've learned. So we have like over a million readers a month, a lot of them are interested in starting businesses. And we are very particular about telling them what it actually takes. And this is the, the critical mistakes that I've seen, which happen over and over again. Number one, everybody wants to play business. They want to get the fancy, beautiful website. They want to get the business cards. They want to start hiring some SEO expert. It's all bullshit. You, for a lot of people, they don't even need a website to tell you the truth. We have students of ours who earn like over $100,000 a year from their business. They don't even have a website. So playing business, doing all the accoutrements of having a business, except for the one thing that matters, having paying customers. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this idea in life that so many of us do, which is let me do everything except the hard thing that matters. Okay. And another great book by Horowitz is uh, the hard thing about hard things. That's a good one. I read that. Best, one of the, yeah, it's amazing. So that's number one. Two is the idea of just dreaming, trying to be 40 before they're 40. And, and I'll, when I was just out of college, I was going to buy a car. And I was trying to think which car I should buy. And I, you know, I had some money saved up now. And I was like, hmm, should I buy a Mercedes? You know, they had these sporty Mercedes. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Who, what 22, 23 year old buys a Mercedes and where do you go from there? You can't go <laughs> down to a Kia. So I reminded myself, don't try to be 40 before you're 40. And we see a lot of people doing this in the online world or starting a business. They, they tell me, Ramit, I'm going to, I need to get a sophisticated marketing automation platform. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? How many people do you have on your list? Oh, 3000, but we're growing rapidly. 10% month over month. I'm like, stop talking. You don't need to be getting a marketing automation platform. You need a simple email provider where you can send emails. That's it. You don't need all this crazy stuff. People don't like to hear that you want to crawl before you walk, before you run. They want to start running. Yeah, I think that's, that's a problem like with a lot of millennials, right? Like oh my in God. their 20s, like they want, they're, they're 20 years old, but they want to have the lifestyle of like a 40 year old that, you know, it takes 20 years to build up. Completely. God, I love this. I, like you look at, go to your parents' house, wherever they are, and you just look, open up their, you know, where they keep their spoons and knives. Look at how many spatulas they have. What do they have? Four, six spatulas? You know how many decades it took them to get six spatulas? <laughs> and we got a bunch of 22 year olds telling me I want to be VP. What are you talking about? Right. But, you know, it's not sexy to put in the work and become truly, um, like, with a craftsmanship mind to become truly masterful at your job. But one day, if you do that, if you follow the process, if you build the systems to do that, you blink your eyes and one day you are masterful at what you do. And suddenly everyone else is looking at you like, whoa, that's so cool. What a life. And they will never realize all the work that you put in, but that's when it becomes intrinsically rewarding. That's awesome. 
No, like for me, like the thing, so I get a lot of people who will approach me and be like, Hey Brett, can I have lunch with you and or coffee and, you know, talk to you. I'm trying to think about starting a business. Okay. And I, I, I do, I've, I, I used to do it more frequently, but I don't do it anymore because, um, you know, I would, you know, tell them what I've done and they I said like, so how long have you been planning this? And they're like, well, it's been about a year. Right. And then I'm like, okay, well, I've given some really, you know, I tell them, just get started. Just like start, mm. start right now. And I'll follow up with them, you know, three months later. Hey, you know, how's it going? Because I'm curious, see if my advice helped at all. And they're like, have you gotten like, and they haven't even started because they're still busy. I think they're playing business, but like not even, they don't even have a business to play with, right? <laughs> it's an imaginary business. So they're, they're really, they ask, always ask these questions about, you know, which, you know, microphone do you use for your podcast? What, you know, what platform do you use? And I'm like, man, I just, I have like a microphone that I've, I plug into my computer and I start talking. That's it. <laughs> And I, think, I feel like they're always kind of disappointed uh, you when they're have when, a secret microphone that makes right. you like build a multi million dollar business, right? And like, and they just like, I think it's like just not getting started. Like, it's, yeah. they they're just get stuck in planning mode or dreaming mode. Well, I'll, I'll, I have the same experience. I feel like we might be the same person because I have I got frustrated when people would want to you know go out to coffee and I would do it, and then I I would also follow up. Notice that they would not follow up. I right, right. Yeah, I would. I would have to follow up. It, it doesn't make any sense. And so I so I'll tell you something. I do this thing. Like I get a lot of emails. I get about two thousand emails a day. I read every single one. You are crazy. How do you? That is nuts. Well, I'll tell you. I first of all, it's I love it because I people will tell you everything in email. It's a very intimate platform and they trust me, right? So they're telling me like the kind of stories that I would never get even publicly one-on-one. Right, like, th- so like so with the stuff they tell their therapist, right? Exactly. Right. And I'm like, this is so juicy. This is amazing. And then also, you know, I've seen a lot of it so I can sight read an email really quickly. Most emails are pretty much the same thing. Um, but every once in a while, I run across these emails that are just absolutely amazing and I respond to like hundreds every day. So, um, I get these emails from people saying, you know, Ramit, your courses are so expensive and this is ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I would do anything, but I don't have the money. I said, okay, Hey, listen, I understand my courses are expensive. They're not the cheapest. Our goal is not to be the cheapest. Our goal is to be the best. I'll tell you what, how serious are you about starting a business? They write back, Oh, I'd do anything. Oh my God, this is crazy. I go, okay, I'll tell you what. I have 11 years of free material on my site and on my YouTube channel. You could go through it and in 30 days you can earn one to $5,000 completely free. You know, I will show you how to earn more. I'll show you how to save more. The chapters from my book are free. I want you to read everything there is and I want you to write me back Tuesday night by 11.59 p.m. and tell me what you've accomplished. Okay, so right now about 50% of them disappear. I never hear from them again. But 50% say, sounds good. I'm on it. And they, you know, slam the table. I say, great. I set a reminder for myself. I check in with them Wednesday. Why Wednesday? Because they never wrote me back on Tuesday. <laughs> and I say, hey, how's it going? And this is, again, I have the numbers to show it because I've done this so many times. About 70% never respond. And the other, like 29%, they go, Oh, uh, yeah, really busy. Um, g- definitely going to get to work on this. Thanks so much! Exclamation point, smiley face. And maybe one percent can show something that they've done. I think that, guys, I think that you should become impatient with yourself. Life is short. I give them a deadline of like forty-eight to seventy-two hours because you can actually change your life in seventy-two hours. You could completely change your finances in seventy-two hours. You could completely change the way you think about fitness in 72 hours. You could hire a trainer or a nutritionist. You could plan your next trip to Thailand with your wife or your husband or whoever it may be. 72 hours, you could change your life. And we have people who are saying, I should wait two years, five years until I know more to start a business. Get impatient with yourself. Right. That's awesome. I love that. Well, Rami, well, this has been an awesome conversation. We've hit on a lot of high level topics as, lot as, the, as well as the nitty gritty. I think we could talk a lot more. I think there's some other things we can talk about. So I'd love to have you back on sometime in the future. I would uh, love it. But before we go, where can people learn more about you and your work? 
Okay, we, if you're interested in online business, we have an entirely new site we've launched called growthlab.com, growthlab.com. And we're talking there about conversion, um, optimization, uh, copywriting, building online products, sales, and psychology. I think people will love it. And of course, the site that I've been writing for 11 years, uh, IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. Awesome. Ramit Sethi, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. My guest today was Ramit Sethi. He is the owner of I Will Teach You To Be Rich. And you can go over to IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com right now and you can find a ton of free content. Trust me, this is not get rich quick type stuff. It's practical, useful information on how to have long-term success. Uh, Ramit's got some great scripts that you can use to ask for raise, negotiate your credit card rate down, um, how to get a better job, and a ton more free content there. Uh, so again, IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com.